cycle. Phencyclidine is known on the street by literally dozens of different names. It's known as angel dust, crystal, peace pill, and it's from the phrase peace pill, peace pill that it's most common an appellation, namely PCP, <coughs> derives. PCP, elephant tranquilizer, rocket fuel, whole slew of hog, I guess those are the most common names. Frequently, fencyclidine is, um, before I get to that, let me just say that in, in a discussion of the hallucinogenic agents, you must remember that in almost all cases, their street sale is often misrepresented. In other words, somebody might say that you are buying something other than fencyclidine, when in fact what you're getting is fencyclidine. So there's a lot of uh, caveat emptor uh, considerations in, in buying hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, fencyclidine <coughs> itself is often misrepresented as THC, mescaline, amphetamine, LSD. Somebody will say they are selling you THC or any one of those other drugs, and in fact what you're getting is fencyclidine. Sometimes even uh, cooking is misrepresented as fencyclidine. Fencyclidine was originally developed in the late 50s by Park Davis. It was developed as a surgical anesthetic. In about 1963, the drug was submitted to human clinical studies as a surgical anesthetic. It's a very effective anesthetic. However, what they found in these human clinical studies was that individuals <laughs> coming out of the anesthesia experienced rather bizarre <laughs> symptoms. They had extremely excitable, had visual hallucinations, or sometimes auditory hallucinations, uh, delirium, and a number of entirely undesirable, unacceptable <coughs> symptoms. They, Park Davis, on the basis of these clinical studies, withdrew the drug for human use from, in 1965. <coughs> so since 1965, it's not been available for human use legally. But in that year, Park Davis remarketed the drug under the trade name Cernoland. And they marketed it under this trade name for use as an animal or vet veterinary tranquilizer and anesthetic. <coughs> and for that purpose, it is still available. The drug itself is usually administered via the oral route, PCP, not certainly, PCP, usually administered through the oral route, it can be smoked, and it also can be injected intravenously, although that route does not appear to be a major route of abuse at the present time. <coughs> The drug is metabolized by the liver, <coughs> and most of the metabolites of, of fencyclidine are pharmacologically inactive. They have no biological or pharmacological activity. Uh, the drug and its metabolites are excreted in the urine. Now the effects that fencyclidine produces 
are rather bizarre. And it is very difficult to, to give you a picture of what the characteristic fencyclidine abuser will, or what kind of symptoms that abuser would present because the drug is basically a depressant drug, although it produces, uh, it produces effects which are characteristic of a central nervous system stimulant. <laughs> so number one, the person can demonstrate or present either symptoms of excitement or depression. or may actually present both types of symptoms over, over a, a, a time course. Secondly, the effects that are produced by fencyclidine abuse are apparently dependent upon the dose that is ingested. <clears throat> Let me just give you a rundown of some of the symptoms that can be associated with what we might consider an overdose of fencyclidine. And we can categorize these as a low dose or low <laughs> exposure overdose, a moderate and a high overdose. These three, of course, are dependent upon the dose, the amount of the drug that was administered. At a low dose, you might see patients who are extremely agitated and excited, demonstrating some incoordination. And they have an a very characteristic symptom of PCP overdose, and that is a blank stare. They just stare out into space. They may be unable, unable to speak. They may have nystagmus. Nystagmus is the movement of the eyeballs, either back and forth or up and down, rapid like this. So they can have either horizontal nystagmus, in which the eyeballs move back and forth, or they can have vertical nystagmus, nystagmus in which case the eyeballs move up and down. They may not, even with a low dose of overdose, they may not have any uh, peripheral sensations, or there may be a decrease in peripheral sensations. In other words, they are not responsive to certain types of stimuli. You stick a pin in their arm, they may not, may not even feel it. Remember, this stuff is an anesthetic agent. Uh, there are certain changes in the electroencephalogram which might be observed. There are what are known as changes in body images. Changes of body images. In other words, they, they feel as though their legs are someplace across the street. Um, general feeling of intoxication similar to that experience with ethanol. A disorganized, disorganization of thought processes. They may become apathetic. And in some cases with a low dose abuse, there may be uh, a temporary amnesia of the overdose experience. If the person has taken a larger dose and is what we might, in what we might know, call a moderate abuse situation, depending on relative to the amount of drug you took, then what you're going to start seeing are more of the depressant symptoms. Uh, the individual may be in a stupor or a coma. Maybe a stupor or a coma. There will be nystagmus again, some vomiting. and a rather unusual uh, symptom, and that is hypersalivation. Copious amounts of saliva are produced um, to the extent that often these people have to have, to have their, have to be, uh, have to do <coughs> suction on them to remove very large <coughs> mucus plugs. There can be some flushing of the skin, shivering, 
the loss of peripheral sensations is intensified, the abnormalities of the electroencephalogram or the EEG are intensified, more severe EEG, EEG abnormalities. Again, the feeling of inebriation, drowsiness, apathy, amnesia of the episode. So, so similar results, similar uh, symptoms rather, the moderate compared to the, to the low, but they're more intense and we pick up a couple more. If the individual is in a high abuse or high dose overdose situation, then that individual may, may fall into a coma, which is rather prolonged, <clears throat> 12 hours or more. Hypertension may develop. There may be repetitive muscular activity, kicking of feet, thrashing of hands, over and over and over and over. There may be convulsions. Peripheral sensations are essentially lost. There, there are none. Certain reflexes, such as the gag reflex and the corneal reflex, are lost. The corneal reflex is the one by which if you touch somebody's cornea, the eye closes. Just if you start doing this to somebody, uh, if you hit the right spot in the eye, the eye will, call, will close, it's a reflex mechanism. These, and these people, they don't have that reflex, they've lost the reflex. I told you convulsions, hypersalivation intensifies, EEG gets worse. And with these individuals, there is often a very prolonged recovery phase, taking several days. <coughs> and during this prolonged recovery phase, the individuals have alternate periods of wakefulness and sleep, sleep, sleeping. They wake up, they go to sleep, they wake up, they go to sleep. They have uh, problems of perceiving their environment accurately. So they have problems of mis misperception. They may develop uh, disorientation. They don't know what they, where they are, what they're doing. And there may be some hallucinations going on during the recovery phase. And some of these individuals, as I said, the recovery phase can take uh, several days, a week, maybe even more. <coughs> now, the chronic user, and these are, these are what we've been talking about primarily, have been acute overdoses. The chronic user of PCP generally is an agitated, excited individual. <clears throat> but then again, he may also be depressed. depends on how much he's taking agitated, excited, or they might be depressed, and they, they may have paranoid psychosis. They become paranoid. The treatment of the acute overdose situation is, one, you place the individual in a setting in which there are few external stimuli few external stimuli, not, no noise, no lights, no touching, you may even have to use earplugs to reduce the noise level. You pump the stomach, or in other words, gastric lavage, to remove any PCP that, is remained, that has remained in the stomach. You maintain a normal urinary Outflow. You make sure the kidneys are working properly because the drug is excreted for, uh, in the urine via the kidneys. You might also administer a laxative, flush out the gastrointestinal tract to remove any PCP that's present. <clears throat> you acidify the urine. In other words, the drug will be more effectively excreted if the urine is acid. The more acid the urine is, the more extensively, the more rapidly the drug will be excreted. And one of the things they do after initial treatment for the acidification of the urine, they have these people drink cranberry juice. This cranberry juice is a rather acidic substance and it will in fact maintain or aid in the acidification of the urine. 
if the individual demonstrates uh, some of the symptoms associated with the high acute abuse, then you might have to use something to treat the convulsions. And the drug of choice probably is diazepam. which is Valium. This will aid in the treatment of the convulsions. You maintain normal respiration because if he's in a high dose situation, then he's going to have respiratory depression probably. So you maintain adequate respiration. And you also <clears throat> treat the hypertension that can be produced in a high dose situation. And again, in the moderate to high dose situation, you have to use suction to remove the mucus plugs and the copious amounts of saliva that are, are being produced. Okay, the abuse of fencyclidine probably first, I think, was first reported in the literature in the late 50s or the early 60s in California, in Haight Ashbury. Uh, after it was out on the street for just a, a, a year or so maybe a couple of years, the abusers soon realized the dangers and the untoward or the undesirable effects produced by the drug and its use fell off very rapidly until there was very few people using fencyclidine. However, it has become, again, an extremely popular drug across the country and in this area, Washington, Maryland, Virginia area, fencyclidine is probably one of the most widely abused uh, drug, although if you exclude marijuana and ethanol, it probably is right up there in the top five. There's a lot of fencyclidine abuse around here. There are a lot of illicit fencyclidine laboratories. Fencyclidine is a relatively easy material to synthesize. Uh, the profits, of course, are tremendous. And fencyclidine has become a major problem of drug abuse. Let me give you some data uh, from a 1970 677 study. There was a study conducted from September of 76 through March of 77. The study was a survey of 2,750 young people who were in drug rehabilitation programs. These are all drug users. They were all less than 18 years of age. And these individuals were asked what drugs had they ever abused, even if they just tried a drug once. Let me give you the results of the study because I think they're rather informative. Marijuana was used at least once by 90%, 90.4% of this group of individuals. Alcohol was used by 89.1%, amphetamines, 45%, hashish, 42%, the barbiturates, about 40%, and then PCP, about 32%. Let me just give you the rest of these. Uh, inhalants. glue sniffers and things of that nature, about 29%. Remember, this is a, a young group of individuals, and inhalants are fairly popular among the young kids that are going to be on drugs. Cocaine, 26%. Uh, opiates other than heroin, opiates other than heroin, about 25%. Heroin itself, about 13%. Over-the-counter drugs, OTC drugs, things you can just go into a, a pharmacy and buy without a prescription, about 8%. And there are a number of things in the pharmacy that you can buy that you can abuse. Uh, methadone, illegal methadone, was about 4%. And then there were other drugs that were abused, about 2%. Now, obviously, the, the percentages indicate that these people were taking or had taken and had used a number of different drugs in their drug abuse careers. 
But it is interesting that PCP is number six. My list is right. I forgot one. Hallucinogenic. Hallucinogenic drugs in general, 40%. It's number seven on the, on the old time hit list. Uh, I don't know how much, I don't know how this relates to the general population because we are obviously dealing with a group of non-randomly selected individuals, individuals who have a history of drug abuse and may have only used PCP a few times in their history. Uh, what was found additionally to, to this uh, breakout is that whites, members of the Caucasian race, used PCP to a far greater extent than either blacks or Hispanics. Of the 2,750 uh, individuals of the Caucasians, approximately 42% said that they had used PCP. For blacks and Hispanics, the percentage was less than 10%. So there seems to be a, a difference in the, uh, uh, the epidemiology. Yeah. That I don't know. Well, it might have something to do with it, or it might just be the fact that it started, it did not start in the ghettos or among uh, non-white uh, users. Uh, it is a drug that is, you know, it's, it's, it's used a lot by kids who come from establishment families. It's not, it's not uh, related probably to any kind of socioeconomic levels. If it is related, I would say that it's probably a higher percentage and higher levels that are used than the lower socioeconomic levels. Also, those people who said they used PCP also admitted to, admitted to using more other drugs than the non-PCP users. In other words, the people who use PCP also use more of these other drugs than those people who did not use PCP. It is, it's always interesting to me that we spend God knows how much money in this country for the treatment of heroin addiction. And you can pick any one of the, almost any one of those drugs on the list, and there probably have been more people who have tried those drugs than have ever become addicted to heroin. Right now we've probably got in this country uh, probably somewhere around half a million heroin addicts, give or take a couple hundred thousand. And the number of people who have used PCP, uh, barbiturates, hallucinogenic drugs, cocaine, probably far exceeds that half a million. And there isn't a whole hell of a lot being done as far as treatment for some of these other disorders. The reason being that uh, of the other drugs on here, other than heroin, the barbiturates are the major drugs to which addiction can, can occur. The rest of these drugs, amphetamines is debatable, but the rest of these drugs do not that heroin and methadone do not produce addiction. And I think there's a, there's a feeling in the minds of a lot of people that if the drug is not addictive, then it can't be too bad. Maybe we don't have to worry about it so much. I know this is a statement that the order of these drugs is in almost the order of the uh, least supposed safety uh, in use. Uh, and almost. It seems, it seems that the higher percentage of uh, most people using marijuana because I assume they would say, why? You know, is, it, is that the correlated reason that the higher percentage uh, they think is because of the safety of the drug, or, or is there some? No, because uh, well, first of all, it's very hard to draw any kind of a correlation of that nature. But you know, alcohol. Uh, if, if you're an alcoholic, obviously that's a dangerous situation. So that's a that's that's a fairly dangerous drug, and yeah, it's up there at the top. I would say that it has more to do with the availability. I think that's one fact. And marijuana, you can go any place and buy marijuana. You can certainly get alcohol, very, very available. Uh, amphetamines are rather available. Over the time of drugs are extremely available. Yeah, but they don't give you the punch unless you know what you're doing. You don't get the kick out of it. Yeah. I think the other factor might be cost. I think the other factor might be the one that you mentioned that is a, a either a, an accurate or a false sense of security about the use of the drug. Uh, marijuana and alcohol have widespread appeal because uh, there's more anecdotal history available to a person. Uh, if I wanted to know if the drug were safe and I didn't know anything about drugs, I'd ask my buddies. And I would find more of my buddies having used marijuana or alcohol and tell me you know, there's no big danger involved and I'd start using it. <coughs> it would be harder for me to find somebody who's used PCP. And second of all, 
I found somebody that's used PCP or a number of people, probably I would get some bad reports. It would be some danger associated uh, with, with the use of that drug. But we got some ugly drugs out there. I don't know if I told you last week or the week before whenever we talked about cocaine, but it's been estimated that 5 million people in this country have tried cocaine at least once. That's, I think that's a rather staggering statistic. That's, one, that's about 2.5% of the population have tried cocaine once. This study would have been done 10 years ago. What do you think would have been number one? 10 years ago, 1968. 68, okay. No. I'd say it would be just about the way it is there. Maybe a greater percentage of amphetamine use. Slightly higher, slightly higher, because as we'll see later, LSD was big around then. But you know, in terms of absolute numbers, then the number of people that were using uh, LSD compared to the number of people that were smoking marijuana are relatively small. We're talking marijuana. We're talking about a situation which has been estimated that maybe 20 or 30 million people in this country, 10 percent or more of the population, has used the drug. LSD probably, certainly far less than 1 percent of the population ever used. I've seen it rather than but, use it. But age-wise, I mean... Oh, in this age category? Yeah, yeah. right. That's what that age I think it would be similar. I don't think it's any PCP on here. I think that would be eliminated. Uh, I don't think cocaine would be that high. These two drugs, PCP and cocaine, 10 years ago, nobody knew about them. It wasn't being used. They weren't being abused at all. all. Whereas all the rest of these were being abused. Amphetamines, to a larger <coughs> extent, that's about the time when people were using speed. And then you start seeing the, the warnings about speed kills and that kind of nonsense, and amphetamine use fell down. Um, I'd say about the same. A PCP and cocaine probably would not even have made the list, or if they did, they would be in very low percentages. Methadone probably wouldn't even be there in 68. It wouldn't be that, that high a percentage because the methadone treatment programs really start taking off about 65 to 68. There wasn't that much uh, illegal methadone to be had. Okay. You had a question? I was thinking also with heroin, so much money spent because of law enforcement, because of the association of heroin and crime. Yeah, but it, you know, if, some, big if, well, if somebody has a real bad barbiturate addiction or amphetamine addiction or is into cocaine, now cocaine okay. costs you a few bucks if you want to maintain a good habit on cocaine. You, know, you can blow forty, fifty thousand dollars a year on cocaine to maintain a, a habit. So there are other drugs here that are very expensive, also. That well, are I don't mean so much expensive, but the fact that it's always been associated with oh. crime in people's minds. Erroneously, minor, perhaps. Erroneously, yeah. yeah, that may be true. Uh, I, don't, <coughs> I don't know how much money is lost in society every year because of barbiturate addiction, amphetamine use, or cocaine use, but I'm sure it's in the billions of dollars. And that's about what we lose in heroin abuse every year. Maybe eight billion dollars or something like that. Five eight billion dollars. I can't think of a drug that should be on the list, or a group of drugs that would have widespread abuse appeal, unless. Well, I can't really think of a drug that would be abused by such a large percentage of the drug abuse population. These are about these are about the major and the, the big drugs. If the survey is done ten, five years from now or three years from now. I think what you'd find is less alcohol, a lot more cocaine. Cocaine is going to move up to the top four or five, I think. People have made the statement that after seeing individuals who were on a, a, a fencyclidine trip, that they would have no idea why anybody would want to abuse that drug. Uh, the symptoms that are associated with its abuse are just often entirely undesirable, and no, we can't understand why anybody would want to, would want to do that to themselves. Okay. They, they, don't, they don't understand? <coughs> um, I really have PCP or PCP. Well, I I'm not really familiar. I always thought it was just uh, strong and formed marijuana. That's the commonly held view, and that's the way, it's, that's the way it was introduced, really, as something better than marijuana somewhere between amphetamines and LSD. Not as dangerous as LSD. It gives you a little better kick than, than marijuana, certainly, and probably a little better kick than the amphetamines. But it's an entirely different type of uh, substance than either one of those pharmacologically. 
and it does have, it's lumped as a hallucinogenic drug because it does produce hallucinations, but uh, it's a dangerous and an ugly drug and an extremely popular one. I don't know why. Is it taken also by storm? Yeah, you can start. You can, any, you know, any route of administration is, is, is available for any of these drugs. It's just that some of them are better routes than others. Um, of course, in Maryland now, the, the, the major, one of the major drugs of abuse in Montgomery County, from what I'm told, is uh, what's known as killer weed, uh, PCP dissolved and, or sprinkled on uh, marijuana or parsley. Okay. Almost all the drug cases that their forensic chemist is doing up there are PCPs and killer weeds, which is really unusual. So this is a hot area for PCP. Okay, let's talk briefly about LSD. Mm. And of course, this is the, the granddaddy of the hallucinogenic agents. Before we get into LSD, let me tell you what it's uh, from what it is derived, basically what kinds of compounds it's associated with. There are a group of compounds known as the ergot alkaloids. And these are compounds that are found on rye, the grain, that has been infected or on which there is a certain fungus growing. So it's rye that has been infected with a certain strain of fungus. These ergot alkaloids are used, have them, certain, certain ergot alkaloids have a use in medicine. There's one known as ergonovine. And another one, ergotamine. These are two examples of, of uh, ergot alkaloids. And these ergot alkaloids are extremely effective as uterine contractors that cause contraction of the uterus. And they are also extremely effective in the treatment of migraine headaches. And for those two reasons, certain ergot alkaloids have accepted valid therapeutic use. All of the ergot alkaloids in their chemical structure have as the basis of their chemical structure lysergic acid. 